Congratulations on your GG. Why, thank you. I know you're finishing up a master's program in creative writing at UBC. Is it harder to take your teachers seriously when you have this award? <laughs> well, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty award-winning bunch themselves, so we, you know, so we, it, we, we shoot around. It balances bit. out. <laughs> After you won the, the Governor General's Award, you were asked why, asked why you think your, your book resonated so much with readers. And you said you think there's a hunger for Aboriginal writing in Canada. This is interesting because I was, I was noting recently that, of course, uh, Joseph Boyden's The Arenda won Canada Reads. Thomas King, uh, uh, The Inconvenient Indian, just won yeah. the uh, RBC Taylor Prize. It does feel like it's an important moment uh, for First Nations writing, Aboriginal writing. Does that resonate for you? I think so. I think that we, it's the story that hasn't been shared. I don't think it's been shared to its full effect, and I think that people are, are wondering what that's all about. I Don't Know More has come in in the last couple of years, and everyone kind of wondered what that's about, what that's about, and, and why people are experiencing that. And I think that people like Tom King, Joseph Boyd, and um, Leanne Simpson just won a great uh, nonfiction prize as well. People are hungry for these stories. They're hungry to an answer that question of why and why people are upset, why, why conditions are the way they are. And the only way to hear that is from people telling their own stories. You said that as a reader, today's indigenous poetry is also what's most compelling to you. What do you think is going on in that writing that isn't happening elsewhere? Poetry is, poetry is everyone's favorite subject at school, right? <laughs> you know, everyone loves poetry. But the thing about poetry is, well, first of all, it, you know, misconceive any notion. Poetry doesn't have to rhyme. Poetry doesn't have to be hard. Poetry is easy. Poetry is a tiny little fragment of something. It's a tiny little snapshot of something. And you don't have to tell a story. You don't have to balance dialogue. You don't have to know grammar. You just have to say something. And what's happening in Indigenous poetry is a bunch of new artists and a bunch of older artists who have been around a long time are, are heroes like Lee Miracle and Marilyn Dumont who have been telling these stories over and over again. And what we're hearing is those stories. They're cutting right to the quick. They're going right for that jugular feeling. And, and they're saying what is in a very concise and accessible way. Right for that jugular feeling. This, I, I found this book of poetry very powerful. This Thank is this you. book of yours. And, and your poems grow out of your own experiences growing up in the north end of Winnipeg, as I said in the introduction. And judging by the references to Riot Girls and heavy metal ballads, <laughs> uh, that was the late 80s and early 90s. How would you characterize the neighborhood and your own relationship to it at that time? At that time, it was my home. I, I'm a non-status and indigenous person. I'm a Métis person, and I never had a home and a community that I could connect to. When I moved to the North End as a young child, I, it was where I became a person. It was where I started having those feelings and those that people get in their pubescent times, right? It's where you, you start thinking about who you are and who you want to be and what you believe in. And I grew up in this environment that really framed all of those things mm. that I became. The, there was tragedy in your life. There was uh, tragedy. One of your brothers died when he was mm -hmm. still in his teens, trying to cross a river that seemed frozen. You said that the apathy you then encountered from the local media and police had a formative impact on you as a person and a writer. Can you speak to that? Well, I think it was really heart-wrenching because when you lose a family member, when anyone gets, gets lost in, in either an actual dying sort of way or in actually when they can't be found, you want everyone to, to share in that. You want some sympathy. But what happens with my brother, my brother was a 18-year-old man, boy. He went uh, out to the bar one night and he was never seen again. But because he was indigenous, because he was from a bad neighborhood, because of all of these things, he, he was not seen as someone that warranted sympathy. And our, and our tragedy was not seen as something that was worthy of being paid attention to. And that was incredibly hard, because it really overtook that tragedy. And, and instead of being a 14-year-old dealing with a lost brother, I became a 14-year-old dealing with a brother who was gone and no one cared. Well, you moved out of the neighborhood. I did. You moved back after you had children. You said yeah. that when you first returned, you became resistant to the neighborhood. What does that mean? I was incredibly resistant to, well, I, I had my, my babies. My babies were little, and when we have little children, we become, we become very raw. We become like, um, I always say, on, to, when your fingernails are bitten too short, you know, everything was raw. I felt everything acutely, and all of the things that had happened in my childhood, I didn't want my daughters to grow up like that. I didn't want them to 
have those same experiences that I had. And what happened was because I just wanted to protect them, I blamed the neighborhood. And, what hap and I blamed the neighborhood, I blamed the place, I blamed everything. And what happened is I started a journey trying to find my way back to my home because I was now angry at my home because all mm. of this thing, all of these things that happened there happened to happen. And how place. do you feel about the North End now? I love it. <laughs> North End. I can't see anybody. I'm looking around like I can see <laughs> anyone. Um, the North End is a beautiful place. The North End is an incredibly historical place. It's been around forever. It has this amazing history. It has these amazing people. Is it misconceived? I mean, it, it is it, absolutely uh, the victim, I should say, of misconception. I think it is absolutely misconceived. I think the way Winnipeg is kind of like the butt of all the jokes in Canada, North End becomes the butt of all those jokes in Winnipeg. They're the people that get picked on. They're the people that um, get get blamed and get, you know, just painted with that bad, bad brush of paint. And what ha but it's not that. And that's um, what I'm trying to do in my work is trying to go into looking closer and looking deeper and looking at these things and seeing that they're not what they seem. You know, we, the North End has so many beautiful initiatives coming out of it. We have this amazing youth group, Aboriginal Youth Opportunities, that are doing insane things. We have uh, the Bannock Lady. We know the Bannock Lady, Althea Gibosh. A fellow, a fellow poet and, and dear friend of mine, she's a person who just came in from the North End and, said, and looked around at the homeless situation in Winnipeg and said, I have to feed these people, and she just fed them. Mm. That's what the North End is. We have Nietzsche Commons, which is this beautiful place. Go there, the food is amazing, there's bannock with everything. Mm. Um, that's, that's what the North End is, it's worker co-ops, it's people helping themselves. I, I, I'd be remiss if, if, if we didn't hear something from the, from the collection, if I didn't give you some time for that. Uh, would you read us a poem? Will that... Are we up for, it, it's a really, it's poetry, so it's sad. <laughs> it's, it's always... It's, you were gonna, we, we had talked about you doing Indians, will you yeah. do that? Yeah, I heard that. That's a sad poem. That's okay. okay. We, you can we, do that. we can go sad. We'll go back up. We'll tell a joke after. You know, get back. No, it's all right. I, I'm okay with sad. We can do sad too. Okay. Um, do you, I mean, do you need to set this up for us or is it self-evident? Uh, it's kind of self-evident. Poetry is supposed to stand on its own. This is, I always call this my anger poem, but the funny thing about I think I'm being angry, I'm really just, it comes off as sad. Poetry is very sad, very depressing. Um, <laughs> This comes out of the... I the can't tell if you're being sarcastic. <laughs> is it sad or isn't it? It really is. Yes, yeah. It really is. Okay. But, you know, we, that's why poets are amazingly funny people, but for some reason what we write about is really sad. And it goes both ways, right? We're, we're all things, all together. But This poem comes out of the experience of losing my brother. It comes out of that, that apathy and that anger and, and that in turn sadness of, of that. And you'll think of a joke while I read it, right? <laughs> Indians. Indians go missing, they tell the family. Indians go missing every day. Blue suits shrug. No sense looking, they said. He'll turn up when he gets bored or broke. Indians drowned, the family finds out. Happens every day. This land floods with dead Indians. This river swells, freezes, breaks open, cold arms of ice, welcomes Indians. Indians get drunk, don't we know it? Do stupid things, like being young, like going home alone, like walking across a frozen river, not quite frozen, and not making it to the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Katharina Vermetz, everybody. Governor General, Literary Award winning poet, North End Love Songs. She's joined us here live on stage at the Burton Cummings Theater.